الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد عبدك ورسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع ومن قلب لا يخشع ومن عين لا تدمع ومن نفس لا تشبع نعوذ بك اللهم من هؤلاء الأربع اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا We begin by thanking and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in abundance and we beseech him to send his peace and blessings upon the last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family and his companions and all those who follow his tradition, his sunnah until the end of time. We beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us that which benefits us to allow us to benefit from that which he has taught us and to increase us in beneficial knowledge. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. We seek his refuge from knowledge which does not benefit and from a heart which does not tremble, from an eye which does not shed tears and from a soul which does not find contentment. We beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ease because nothing can be accomplished without success and without ease from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to accomplish it. As to what follows, uh, welcome back to yet another blessed Wednesday night class in one of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we hope and expect and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us of those who gathered in one of his houses to remember him. And we hope and pray and expect that the angels have descended upon this gathering, have surrounded it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has immersed us in his infinite mercy, and that he will mention us as we are mentioning him in a gathering much higher than this one and much better than it. Ameen. The topic for this Wednesday night class, or for the next um, two weeks after tonight, so this will be a three-part class, inshallah ta'ala, is centered around a very famous supplication, a very famous dua, known as Sayyidul Istighfar. Sayyid is the Arabic word for, what does Sayyid mean? Master, Okay, what else? What else could it be? What else? Chief, as you find in the, uh, <laughs> in the title. <laughs> the, chief, the chief of a tribe or the chief of a group of people would be known as Sayyid. We have some people named Sayyid. MashaAllah. First names and last names. Uh, many people who uh, believe that their lineage goes back to the Prophet wasallam, or they have been able to trace this back, they name their families Sayyid, for example. Or they will name their children Sayyid. This is very common in many parts of the world. Um, so Sayyid means someone that is honored, someone that is obviously special at the head of a group of people. Uh, they have the f uh, famous proverb in Arabic, Sayyidul Qawmi Khadimuhum. That the Sayyid, the chief, the master, the most honorable of a group of people is the one who serves them to show that basically serving people is actually um, uh, an act which is very lofty and praiseworthy. Uh, by the way, uh, you are most welcome to sit down on the floor of the musalla and enjoy yourself and be comfortable. However, if you are more comfortable on a chair, we've got plenty to go around, inshallah ta'ala. So please do not hesitate to grab one, or if you would like one, we can come and bring you one. Anybody would like a chair? Okay, don't feel uh, ashamed or shy uh, if you need to sit on a chair. Uh, it's, it's here for you, inshallah ta'ala. Otherwise, it's nice sometimes to just sit in the masjid and sit on the floor and be close to one another. Our teachers used to say that, come close so that there will be more barakah and there will be more energy in the gathering. Um, but you can sit as close as you feel comfortable, inshallah ta'ala. So, Istighfar. Sayyid, we know what Sayyid means, and Istighfar. Istighfar is the Arabic word which means what? Forgiveness? Mm -mm. Istighfar doesn't mean forgiveness. Repentance? Istighfar doesn't mean repentance. Thank you. Istighfar means to seek repentance, to seek forgiveness. Whenever you find, and we're not going to delve too much into Arabic grammar here, but whenever you find 
Alif Sin Ta in the beginning of an Arabic word, generally speaking, then it means Talabu Shay. And so Istighfar is to seek Maghfira. The root word is Gha, related to the letter Gha, Fa, Ra, which means forgiveness and repentance, etc. So when we put Alif Sin Ta in the beginning, that means we are seeking it, we are requesting it. Just like when we need rain and there's drought, we pray Salatul Istisqa, seeking Suqya, seeking to be uh, rained upon, to have water, um, etc. There are many examples of this in the Arabic language. So Istighfar is to seek repentance. So Sayyidul Istighfar, Dua U Sayyidul Istighfar is the supplication which is the, the master, the best supplication to seek repentance. And on that note, we can spend a few moments talking about repentance, about istighfar. The process of seeking repentance is what we refer to as tawbah. As tawbah, to return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an act of worship. Making dua in general is an act of ibadah. As a matter of fact, the Prophet sallallahu said about it. What did the Prophet sallallahu say about ibadah in a very short hadith? Anybody know? The Prophet ﷺ said, oftentimes you hear people quote a narration, they say, الدُّعَاءُ مُخُّ ibada." Anybody heard that before? They say, dua is the essence, the bone marrow, if you will, of worship. This is actually an extremely weak hadith. And there's no need to quote it because there is an even more explicit hadith than this. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الدُّعَاءَ هُوَ ibada." And this is an authentic hadith, that dua is worship. Meaning the essence, the manifestation of ibadah, of worship, is in dua. And we will spend some time talking about that uh, soon, inshaAllah. But it's an act of worship. And tawbah, the process of seeking repentance, is also an act of worship. It's a necessary one and it's a highly encouraged and praiseworthy act of worship. And it's one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves very much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah An-Nisa, Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. Allah wants to forgive you and respond to your tawbah, seeking of repentance and coming closer to Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah yuhibbu at-tawabin in the Quran. Allah loves those that are constantly doing tawbah. Tawabin, they're constantly doing it. And the idea of tawbah being constant is very important. It's not a one-time thing that happens in our lifetime. It is something constant and consistent. And the reason for that is because we are also constant and consistent in our poor choices. And that is the nature of the human being. There is no one that is perfect. There is no one that is free of fault. The Prophet wasallam said, Kullu bani Adam Every child of Adam makes mistakes. وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ But the best of those that make mistakes are those that make tawbah. They seek repentance. It is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have this process of tawbah emphasized so much in our deen. It's from the perfection and the beauty of this deen of Islam and from the tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that tawbah is always an option. Islam is not a religion where somebody else has to do something for you to be forgiven. Where somebody else has to make a sacrifice for you to be forgiven. Or Islam is not a religion where someone needs to help you in your process of forgiveness. But Islam is a religion which comes to bring the link between the creator and the creation direct without anyone in between. That's the idea. When one of the companions in one of the very famous expeditions entered upon the ruler of the opposing army and he came into his tent, he told him, what do you guys want? What, what's up with you guys? He said, this messenger came to us to remove us from ibadatul ibad ila ibadati rabbil ibad. To take us away from worshipping creation to worshipping the creator of all creation. وَمِن ضِيقِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَى سَعَةِ الْآخِرَةِ And from the narrowness and the limited nature of this dunya, of this life, to the expansive and limited nature of the akhirah. As Muslims, we don't live for this dunya. This dunya is an opportunity for us to better and enhance our situation in the Akhirah. 
That's exactly what it is. It's an opportunity, a limited time frame for us to do what we can with the abilities that we have been given to maintain patience and gratitude so that when we reach the Akhirah, not if, but when <coughs> we find ourselves in the Akhirah, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that situation will be a good and comfortable situation. And so that process of Tawbah is highly encouraged. And because we are always making poor choices, because we're human beings, that's, what we were, that's how we were created, we are meant to constantly and consistently do Tawbah as well. Without getting sick of it, without being ashamed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we'll touch upon that some more uh, shortly, inshaAllah ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu told us in a hadith, that if you were to stop repenting and doing tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would replace you with another creation that would commit sins, that would make poor choices, but they would actually turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance and tawbah. Because that is how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves tawbah. Now, when we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we are making dua, Dua means to ask for something, to seek something. And we are doing this act of worship, of dua. We should understand that dua as an act of worship is something that is extremely emphasized in the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ, regardless of the outcome. Take a look at these stories. Rasulullah ﷺ is approached one day by Abu Huraira. You guys know who Abu Huraira is? Abu Huraira, that's not his actual name. What's his actual name? Abdurrahman? Abdurrahman ibn Sakhr al-Dawsi. Sure? Positive? There's over a dozen opinions about what Abu Huraira's name is. One of the most famous opinions is that his name is Abdurrahman, others are that his name is Abdullah. Abdurrahman ibn Sakhr al Dawsi. He's known as Abu Huraira for a cat that he used to be so merciful with and take care of. Huraira is a small hirra, cat, kitten, if you will. This companion is very special. What makes him so special? Narrating a lot of hadith, an incredible amount of hadith. An incredible amount of hadith. One of the most out of the companions in the number of narrations that he related from the Prophet Abu Huraira did not spend a very long time with Rasulullah Just a handful of years. Just a few years with the Prophet So he was asked, how are you able to narrate so many hadith of the Prophet when you only spent a few years with him? And those that were with him, their whole lives, they didn't narrate as many hadith as you. He said that while you were all busy in the marketplace, I was busy following Rasulullah and memorizing his statements. So he was very close to the Prophet ﷺ. He spent a lot of time with him. Abu Huraira had a mother. This is in Medina. Um, when I lived in Medina, the school that we went to, right in the entrance of a school is a riverbed. Uh, it, it's dry now, but when it rains, it fills up with water. It used to be where a river would run through. It's called, uh, it's called, uh, subhanAllah, it's called Wadi Al-Aqiq. It's a Wadi Mubarak. It's a blessed riverbed, Wadi Al-Aqiq. Uh, further down that riverbed is where Abu Huraira, where his mother lived. His mother was not Muslim. She was not a believer. Quite the contrary, actually. She was quite hateful of Islam. And Abu Huraira used to continuously call her to Islam in a very merciful manner and invite her to come to the Prophet ﷺ. But she would reject. On one occasion, she responded in a very offensive way. And she said something very offensive about Rasulullah And Abu Huraira's feelings were hurt. And so, instead of arguing back because of his kindness towards his mother, even though she was a disbeliever, because kindness to the parents is uh, a part and parcel of our deen and part and parcel of our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if someone's parents are not a Muslim. He goes to the Prophet وسلم, Abu Huraira and he tells the Messenger of Allah وسلم, please make dua for my mother. Please make dua for my mother 
that she accepts Islam. And so the Prophet ﷺ raises his hands and he makes dua. And he says, Allahumma hadi, O Allah, guide the mother of Abu Huraira. May Allah guide her. And he makes his dua over and over. Abu Huraira returns back to his house and upon entering upon his mother, he finds that she is ready to now accept Islam. The dua of Rasulullah was answered. And so Abu Huraira goes back to Rasulullah and he asks for another dua. He says, Oh Allah, make me and my mother beloved to the believers and make the believers beloved to us. And the Prophet ﷺ made this dua. And we love Abu Huraira. And we are sitting here talking about him 1400 years later. And his mother, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. May Allah be pleased with them. The dua. The Prophet ﷺ, he entered one day to give Jumu'ah khutbah. I want you to imagine this. In a couple days we'll have Jumu'ah. The Prophet ﷺ enters and he goes up to the minbar to give Jumu'ah khutbah. Imagine you're sitting here waiting for the khutbah to start. And the Prophet ﷺ comes to give khutbah and a man storms into the masjid. And he yells at the top of his lungs, O Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, in the middle of the khutbah. So imagine somebody storms into the masjid and does that. Everyone's going to be looking at him. He can't even wait for the khutbah to be done. This man is so desperate in his need. He tells the Prophet ﷺ, he cries out in front of everyone, he says that our plants are, are, have died, our plants and animals have died, and our children are thirsty, they're starving. We need rain. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us rain. And so the Prophet ﷺ, right there in his exact spot, he responds by raising his hands, and he makes dua to Allah for rain. And he makes dua and he pleads and begs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rain and for mercy and for it is. And he continues begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The companions narrate he did not stop until the clouds came over them. And then those clouds became dark and heavy and then they released and the water came down. And the Prophet did not bring his hands down until his beard became wet from the rainwater that was falling from above. The intensity by which he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nuh alayhi salam, he made dua in the Quran with three words. With three words. In Surah Al-Qamar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Nuh. He said, Inni maghloobun fantasir. Oh Allah, I am maghloob. I've been defeated. I don't have anything left. Fantasir, give me victory. فَفَتَحْنَا أَبْوَابَ السَّمَاءِ بِمَاءٍ مُنْهَمِرٍ Allah says immediately the skies were opened up <coughs> with gushing water. وَفَجَّرْنَا الْأَرْضَ عُيُونًا فَالْتَقَ الْمَاءُ عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ قَدْ قُدِرٍ And then from the earth as well water comes out until the water from above then the water from the bottom met. Water coming from everywhere. وَحَمَلْنَاهُ عَلَىٰ ذَاتِ أَلْوَاحٍ وَدُسُرٍ And we carried him on planks and pegs meaning in his boat. تَجْرِي بِأَعْيُنِنَا It was flowing. The boat was moving, everyone in it was safe. So many huge events that happened in nature as a response to three words that Nuh made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So dua is powerful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when we make dua. It's an act of worship and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises to answer dua. But when we hear these stories, for some of us, the thought that comes to our mind is, yeah, well, those are prophets. Those are prophets. Nuh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa can you compare me to them? Who am I? Anbiya, amazing people. Of course their dua is going to be answered. Of course it is. So, you can't tell me about that. Why is my dua not being answered? To understand this dilemma, if you will, we can approach it from a couple of ways. First, it's very important for us to understand that dua is an act of worship regardless of the outcome. That's the first thing to keep in mind about dua. And you have these booklets, some space was made in it for you to take notes if you wish. If you wish. That dua is an act of worship, it's a ibadah, and it's one of the best acts of worship. Now we're going to be talking a lot about ibadah, worship, 
what we often translate as worship, uh, and what it means and what it constitutes, because it is mentioned in the actual supplication in, in this course, in this uh, booklet that you have here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to make dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, call upon me, make dua. It's a commandment. So it's something that we have to do. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ I will respond to you. So here we have two clauses. There is a command and there is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is in our responsibility is to fulfill that command. What is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to fulfill that promise. Whether or not we see that promise in the way that we want or not, we still have to fulfill that command. And we will address the fulfillment of that process, of that promise momentarily. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in the Quran tells us about who he is by way of his perfect and blessed names and attributes. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا To Allah belongs the best and most perfect of names, so call upon Him with them, by them. فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا Again, you find another fi'l, amr, a verb in the command form. You've got to do it. There's a commandment there. And this also tells us one of the main purposes behind knowing and memorizing the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we can use them in our dua. So when we come across the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the especially merciful, most gracious, compassionate, His mercy, a specific mercy for the believers and a general mercy for all creation, then when we are seeking mercy, we can say, Ya Rahman, Irhamni. Ya Rahim, Irhamni. Oh, most merciful, have mercy upon me. Show me mercy and grant me mercy. When we come upon the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Ghani, and we're going through some financial troubles, through a tight fiscal situation, then we say, Ya Ghani, Aghnini, O oh, you who is most wealthy, who is not in need of anyone, grant me wealth. When we want strength, Ya Qawi, the most strong, grant me strength. When we want forgiveness, Ya Ghaffar, اغفر لي. يا عفو, اعفو عني. O the one who pardons and conceals mistakes. Pardon and conceal my mistakes. And then that conversation becomes more intimate. And it becomes more special. And we are more focused now. Because we are making a relationship between how we call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what exactly we are asking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing that we have to realize and internalize and remember always is that dua is an act of worship and it is something we are commanded to do regardless of what the outcome is. The second thing which is very important is not to be hasty. They used to teach us proverbs of Ben Franklin. Isn't one of them haste makes waste? Is that one of them? Is that it? Kind of like how a Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. You guys know those? Got some crickets. Haste makes waste. They say, فِي الْعَجَالَ nadama وَفِي التَّأَنِّ salama. With haste, there is regret. And with being um, calm and composed is salama. Is you will be, you will find peace and you will be protected. الْعَجَالَ مِنَ shaytan. Haste is from uh, shaytan and this is in matters of, of our life not in what is the exception to that the exception to that is in yes the exception to that is in acts of ibadah acts of worship so for example if they say you know um, it's time for fajr let's pray fajr and you say ah, I'll do it later no we should Make the, the acts of ibadah priority. Somebody has a considerable amount of money saved in the bank and they're healthy. And you say, come on, go for hajj. You say, eh, I'll, I'll do it later. I'll go for hajj later. But that should not be the attitude with ibadah. 
That's why Musa alayhi salam said, وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّي لِتَرْضَى I hasten to you, O my Lord, so that you would be pleased with me. So not to be hasty. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said in a hadith narrated in a tirmidhi The Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, um, مَا مِن دَاعٍ يَدْعُ اللَّهِ That nobody that makes dua to Allah, a caller who is calling upon Allah, بِدَعْوَةٍ إِلَّا أَعْطَاهُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى ثَلَاثَةَ أَشْيَاء That nobody calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him إِحْدَى gives him one of three situations. So when you make dua sincerely, one of three things is guaranteed to happen. One of three things is guaranteed to happen. What are they? إِمَّا أَنْ يَسْتَجِيبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا the first option is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to this dua in this, excuse me, in this dunya. Meaning, in our lifetime, you will see the response to your dua. Oh Allah, I am asking you for uh, health from my sickness. And then after some time, alhamdulillah, you get over that sickness and you are healthy. Allah has answered the dua right now in this dunya in your life. That's the first option. The second option is وَإِمَّا أَنْ يَكُفَّ عَنْهُ شَرٍ وَإِمَّا أَنْ يَكُفَّ عَنْهُ شَرًا بِدُعَائِهِ Or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will repel some harm or some evil from him because of this dua. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Somebody can, let's take the previous example that we used of someone being ill. A person could be sick, they could be ill, some kind of an ailment, and they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for health, for recovery from this ailment. And they're making dua day in, day out, month in, month out, year in, year out, and they are still suffering from this ailment. And so they come and they say, I dua is not being answered. Well, this continuous dua, as it is rising up into the heavens, it can collide with something else that has been destined for you to take place, some other difficulty, and the dua repels this difficulty from taking place. So in the case of someone who is ill, they can be making dua, making dua, and they say, my dua is not being answered. And we would say, how do you know your dua is not being answered? You haven't died. It could be that this sickness would be so terrible that they would pass away from it. But they do not pass away. And so that is a big difficulty that is being repelled by this dua. So there could be some harm that you are kept from that you don't know because it hasn't happened to you. Because our knowledge is limited. Our knowledge is limited only to cause and effect. What we see happening and then we see the result, that is our ilm. That is the knowledge of the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is not linear. It's not limited by our dimensions of time and by our understanding of cause and effect. The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes what is happening now, it includes what will happen in the future, and it includes what happened in the past, but it goes even beyond that by including what could have happened, if it were to have happened, how it would have been, even though it never happened. And that is the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we don't have that kind of knowledge. وَمَا أُوتِيتُم مِّنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Allah said in Surah Al-Isra, what you have been given from knowledge is really little compared to what is really out there. As we always like to say, our teachers said, what you see is far less than what you don't see. What we have been given access and knowledge to is very limited compared to what's really out there. So, that is the second option. Either that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers dua in the dunya, you see the answer, number one. Number two, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects you from some harm, repels some other harm or difficulty from you by way of this dua, even though that's not exactly specifically what you asked for. Or thirdly, the third option is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُؤَخِّرَهُ لَهُ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَيُعْطِيهِ بِهَا حَسَنَاتِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delays the response of this dua until Yom Al-Qiyamah, until the Day of Judgment. And so the person will come on the Day of Judgment expecting a certain amount of good deeds based on what they remember of the good that they did in their life. 
And yet when they stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they, found a, they find a mountain, a huge amount of good deeds. Where did all this come from? This is a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed. And it was replaced with a huge amount of hasanat. So on al-akhirah, that person's status would be elevated. If there had their dua been answered in the dunya, they would have gotten what they asked for, but their level in al-akhirah would have been at a lower level than it is because of all of these extra hasanat. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not respond to their dua in the dunya, but He delayed it for them in the akhirah to increase their record and their account of good deeds of hasanat, and hence their status in al-akhirah is elevated greatly. Big status in al-akhirah. Because of these du'as that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala postponed. Because this was what, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite wisdom, this, was, this is what is best for that person. That they have a higher status in um, al-akhirah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ Any one of you will be responded to, your du'a will be responded to, مَا لَمْ, ما لم يستعجل. So long as they don't get hasty. What does that mean, they don't get hasty? Don't get hasty meaning that they make dua, they make dua, they make dua to Allah, and then they don't see the answer, they don't see option one of those three options, and so they say, ah, forget it. This isn't working. It's never going to happen. My dua is never going to be answered. It's hopeless. When we have that kind of reaction, yeah, the dua won't be answered. يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ Definitely, it will be responded to any one of you. مَا لَمْ يَسْتَعْجِلْ Don't get hasty. You gotta wait. You gotta be patient. You know those stories we mentioned in the beginning? About how the dua was answered right away? Amazing, powerful, inspiring. You think that was always the case with the Anbiya? With the messengers? Zakariya alayhi salam. In the beginning of Surah Maryam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about his dua, إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيًّا He called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most intimate and secretive of ways. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him offspring, to grant him a child. Why did he uh, make dua to Allah in a very intimate and secretive way? Why do you guys think? Hmm? Why did Allah... Tell us that he is making dua, dua and khafiya. Hmm? He is having a conversation to, with Allah. He tells him, Inni wahan al minni. My bones, my bones are weak. I'm old. Washta'ala al ra'su shayba. It's an interesting uh, word. Ishta'ala. It's a verb that you use in Arabic to light something. You know, when you, when you like light a matchstick or you light a fire. He says, my, my hair, my head has been lit with shayb, with meaning glistening. Meaning he's really old, really white hairs. And his wife, Umra'ati, and he talks about that. Very old in age. Why was his dua, dua an khafiya? Fahabli min ladunka waliya. Grant me offspring. What do you think? Yes, Amir. Absolutely. That is exactly correct. You see, some authors, some authors, they mentioned that he made dua, dua and khafiya because that's more sincere. Uh, now that might apply to you and I, but when we're talking about the NBA, the NBA, their level of ikhlas is, is very high. The NBA do not do anything to show off. Um, but what is more um, within context is that he was so old and his dua was so, to the people, unbelievable. That he was ashamed, people would laugh at him. You're making dua for a child? You? At your age, in your situation, and you want a child now? Allah's. Allah <laughs> Those days are over, man. It's done with, there's no chances for you for that. And so he was intimate. You know how old he was, Zakaria? You know how old he was, Ya Adam? Beginning of Surah Maryam? Some of the history books mentioned that he was 100 years old when he was making this dua. How about his wife, Umra'ati Aqir? My wife can't have offspring. How old was his wife? Some of the books mention that she was 90 years old. And yet he's making this dua. So what was, their, what was the response to this dua? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell him? 
Allah granted him a son. Yahya. Lam naj'al lahu min qablu samiyya. Nobody has had this name before. Yahya, from hayat, from life. Because he would later be martyred. But Allah wants us to know that those that are, are killed unjustly in martyrdom, they are alive. They're not actually dead. Yahya. Lam naj'al lahu min qablu samiyya. Not only did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him what he was asking for, but Allah gave him even more than that. Allah didn't just give him Yahya. He gave him Yahya. What did he say about him? Musaddiqan. That he was truthful to the uh, scripture and the scripture that came uh, before. Wa um, Sayyidan. And Sayyid. Remember he said Sayyidan. Wa Hasuran. A Abidan. A devout worshiper. And he's from the Anbiya. And he made him a messenger as well. Not only you get a son, you get a son who is a Nabi, who is a prophet and a messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even stop there as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another surah, when he tells us about uh, Zakariya, he says, وَأَصْلَحْنَا لَهُ زَوْجَهُ In addition to the offspring and the child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we perfected, and we, we perfected your wife, spouse. What was wrong with his wife? Some of the history books mentioned that the wife of Zakariya, the beautiful wife of Zakariya, alayhi salam, she had one thing that she struggled with, which was anger. She was very quick to become anger, and she couldn't control her anger. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed this from her. Not only did he give him a son, he gave him a son, made him Nabi, and perfected his whole family situation. But Zakariya, how old was he? A hundred years old. You think he just started making this dua when he was like a few days away from his 100th birthday? He's like, okay, time to start making this dua. Yeah, and you would imagine he's been making this du'a in his 20s and in his 30s and in his 40s and his yeah, and in decades and he's making this du'a. And now he sees the answer. يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَسْتَعْجِلْ You will be responded to so long as you don't get hasty. Ayyub alayhi salam, the same thing. وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Ayyub calls out, I have been afflicted with this harm, with this evil. Terrible disease. Everybody left him. All his friends, all his companions, all the neighbors, everyone except his wife and two friends. Eventually, even those friends left him. Some of the historians mention 18 years in this illness. Some mention more. Years and years of making dua and being patient with this difficulty. But he didn't get hasty. He didn't say, why aren't you answering? I'm a Nabi. If anybody should be hasty with their dua, it would be a Nabi. I'm a messenger. He's receiving wahi. He's receiving revelation. Why aren't you answering my dua, O oh Allah? He can ask Allah directly. But they never did that. Never, never did the Anbiya ever do that. And the Quran is full of examples of the Anbiya, of the best of people making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They never got hasty. Musa alayhi salam with his brother Harun. Musa and Harun uh, uh, in the, uh, Surah Al-A'raf رَبَّنَا طُمِسْ عَلَىٰ أَمْوَالِهِمْ وَشْدُدْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ It comes in a narration. Musa is making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically uh, punishes Fir'aun and his people in their wealth and uh, um, for what they have disobeyed and, and rejected of the message. And he's making this dua and Harun is saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. They're making dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ قَدْ أُجِيبَتْ دَعْوَتُكُمَا فَاسْتَقِيمَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعَانِي سَبِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ قَدْ أُجِيبَتْ دَعْوَتُكُمَا Your dua, you two, you and Harun, your dua has been answered. Ibn Kathir in his tafsir of these verses, he mentions that the istijaba, that the response to this dua came 40 years later. Musa and Harun, not one Nabi making dua, two Anbiya making dua together. And their dua came 40 years later. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom knew that if it was answered 39 years, it would not be appropriate. Or 41 years later, it would not be appropriate. But that was the best time for this dua to be answered. يُسْتَجَابُ لِأَحَدِكُمْ مَا لَمْ يَسْتَعْجِلْ your dua will be responded to so long as you don't get hasty. In Surah Al-Baqarah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us an amazing verse about dua. Who remembers it? 
Alaykum as It's sandwiched in between the verses of fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ If they ask you about me, um, then I am near. I answer the call of the one who is calling so long as they call, as soon as they call upon me, as soon as they make dua. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي Let them respond to my call. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us to make dua to him. وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ And let them have iman in me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us to have iman. Would a person that doesn't have iman even be making dua in the first place? A person that doesn't believe in Allah, would they be making dua to Allah? No. So then Allah is talking to people that are going to call upon him and make dua. Why does he then tell us to have iman? Because when you're in that situation where you are making dua and calling upon Allah and then you don't see the answer and we start feeling hasty and we start making statements, we start having emotions. If we don't control ourselves and, and understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is infinite, then that might lead us to harm our iman. But we have to have iman Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, conviction and belief. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your creator is the most wise and the most able and the most capable of responding to your dua. Dua is of two types. There are two types of dua, they say. Dua ul mas'ala or dua ul talab and dua ul ibadah. The dua of seeking something, of asking something, and the dua of ibadah, dua of Worship and servitude. Dua al talab or dua al mas'ala includes a dua where you are specifically verbally asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. Oh Allah, grant me health. Oh Allah, grant me knowledge. Oh Allah, grant me wealth. Oh Allah, etc. Oh Allah, grant me jannah. Oh Allah, grant me light in my grave, etc. Dua al ibadah, as we will come to talk about what ibadah is next week, inshallah ta'ala. is includes and encompasses all of the actions of the heart the heart has actions the heart has actions does the heart have actions uh, amir walid does the heart have actions the heart doesn't have any actions well i mean it beats it's pumping blood through your body it's a difficult job you know it doesn't take a break come on give your heart some credit but there are other actions not necessarily physical actions but they are a'malul qulub like for example, khawf, fear of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Raja, hope in the mercy and the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inaba, pouring your heart out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tadarru, humility, showing humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these are actions of the heart. They are not actions of the limbs, tangible that you see or you feel with the senses. But they are actions of the qalb. And when we are talking about the heart here, we are talking about the spiritual heart which is closely related to the physical one that beats, but it is another dimension, not a tangible, physical dimension. And so these are the types of dua. Now, when we are making dua, we need to have, when we are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something, then we need to have both of these types of dua manifest simultaneously. And this is our segue into how to make dua and what the etiquettes of such are. And the first is that there is ikhlas. There is sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any act of worship, there has to be ikhlas. There has to be sincerity. There has to be seeking of reward and pleasure from Allah exclusively alone. And so dua cannot be to someone else. Dua is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, you have the presence of the heart. So you can make dua with your tongue and your lips, but your mind and your heart is very, very far away from the words that you are uttering. And that's why it is very good to memorize these supplications. Whether you want to memorize them in Arabic or you memorize the translation, there are so many 
dua and supplications that the Prophet ﷺ taught us and that Allah has taught us in the Qur'an. It's great and it's encouraged to memorize them. But it's not going to do you any good if you are memorizing them and you are simply repeating them with the tongue and the heart is completely unaware. I have no idea what I just said. Not there. How is that a conversation with Allah? How are you actually asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something? It doesn't work. There has to be the presence, wujud of the qalb. The heart has to be there. And it has to be alert to what you are asking for. This is when you really have the perfect situation of dua. And so those actions of the heart, they've got to be interacting. Just like the tongue is doing actions and the lips are moving and you are making these statements and you are having a conversation with Allah, the heart also has to have those emotions and those inner actions. Awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazement, gratitude, hope and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there also has to be yaqeen. Yaqeen is the Arabic word which means certainty. Certainty. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ud'u Allah, make dua to Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijaba, kama qara alayhi salatu wasalam. And you are certain and guaranteed, you are absolutely positive that the answer will come, that the dua will be responded to. That's the mindset and the attitude. You can't be making dua thinking in your head, maybe this will go through, maybe not. I don't know. Might work, might not. But let me just give it a shot anyways. That's not the appropriate mindset to have when making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to have certainty. I remember in Medina, um, uh, some of the residents, some of the locals of Medina, they would tell us about the old timers. Um, because there used to be a lot of mazadir, a lot of farms and orchards. There are still many in Medina, but way fewer than there used to be due to, you know, urbanization and spread of buildings and cities and whatnot. Uh, but Medina used to be a forest of palm trees and other plants that they used to grow as well. It was really intense and beautiful. Um, so uh, they told us that they used to make Salatul Istisqa when they would go out for the prayer of rain, um, uh, and they still do this uh, until today. Every so often, there will be a Salatul Istisqa. The people will come together and there will be dua seeking and asking Allah for rain and for mercy, begging Allah for forgiveness. They said what they used to do is when they would go out for Salatul Istisqa, they used to prepare the Majari, Al Moya, Al Mazra'a. Where the water uh, runs through, through the garden. Uh, what do you call them? When the, you know they make those ditches in the soil? The irrigation, not tunnels, channels. That's the word I was thinking of. Water channels. They would prepare those water channels in the morning before they go out to Salat al-Istisqa. What does that tell you of their mindset? It tells you the mindset of, I'm going for Salat al-Istisqa, the rain will come. Allah is going to make it rain. They said they would go out for Salatul Istisqa, the Salat seeking rain, they would go carrying their umbrellas. You don't know if it's going to rain or not, but it's that yaqeen. The dua is going to be answered. Having that certainty. That's the mindset that you should have when making dua. That has to do with your mindset and your sincerity and your heart. How about actual physical etiquettes? There are many. We could uh, spend a lot of time talking about this, but we are running out of time. Very briefly, take note of these etiquettes. <clears throat> you can make dua at any time. Dua is uh, an act of worship which you can do at any time, any place. Whether you're in the masjid or you're at home in the morning, in the midday, any time when you're driving, you can make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, absolutely. But keep in mind these etiquettes so that you can enhance your dua experience so you can have special, extra special effort in some times of the day or night with your dua and to increase the chances of your dua uh, being answered. So keep in mind some of these etiquettes, but take them as that, as etiquettes. They're not mandatory. You could be driving to work in the morning and making dua to Allah. That's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But sometimes try and implement all of these etiquettes so you can have a, like a full package dua experience. The first of which is to choose an appropriate time. As we said, any time is good time for dua. But there are some special times that are more special. 
Uh, the Prophet ﷺ told us about these times. For example, when it's raining, the Prophet ﷺ said, when it's raining is a good time to make dua. When a person is traveling, make dua when you're traveling. Dua of the traveler is answered. And when a person is ill, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, uh, in the last third of the night, in the last third of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ says, Yanzilu Rabbuna ila sama'i dunya. And he asks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks, who is making dua, who is asking so I can give them, who is seeking forgiveness, I will forgive them. In the famous hadith of the last third of the night. So the last third of the night is a special time. In sujood, um, it is said the time between the two khutbas, in khutbah al-jum'ah, those few seconds when the imam sits down between the two khutbas is a time of istijaba. On the day of Friday, there is a time when dua is mustajab. We don't know exactly when it is. Many of the scholars said it's the last hour of the day, before Maghrib, the last hour of the day of Jumu'ah, of Friday. Ramadan, the night time of Ramadan, the last ten nights, etc. All of these are good times. In Umrah, in Hajj, all of these are good times to make dua. So look out for these times. Take note of them and seek these times out and dedicate these special times to dua. So choose a good time. And also, in addition to those blessed times, also choose a good time for you as well. A time when you are not stressed out, when you're not running to catch an appointment or meet a deadline, when you, can be, when you are more likely to be focused and pay attention to the dua. Uh, a time when you can be as free from distractions as possible. Seek out these times. Secondly, it is praiseworthy and it is recommended to be in a state of tahara. To be in a state of purity, of ritual purity. Whether that means the minor purity just by making wudu, or if a person needs the major ritual purity, taking a shower. But be in a state of purity. Make wudu. If you, let's say you have some free time, you say, I really want to have a special conversation with Allah. You go and make wudu as if you're preparing to make salah. But you make wudu and then you sit down and you make your dua. Because dua is an act of ibadah as well. And there's dua in salah. Which is amazing. It is also praiseworthy to face the qibla. It is praiseworthy and recommended to face the qibla when making dua. Can you make the dua facing a direction other than the qibla? Yes, you can. But right now we are talking about extra special etiquettes that you can do. So it is good, recommended and praiseworthy to face the qibla. Begin your dua by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, expressing gratitude and praise exalting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and extolling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also begin your dua with one of the best forms of dhikr, salat ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sending prayers and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And likewise, do that at the end as well. Conclude your dua with um, thanks and praise and gratitude, hamd, thana, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also conclude it with a salat ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sending salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As part of your dua, as you are asking Allah for different things, matters of this dunya, matters of the akhirah, also include in your dua to make it a conversation, uh, statements which express humility. So for example, when you want to ask Allah for wealth, you can precede that by saying, Oh Allah, I am the most Poor, you are the most wealthy, I am most in need of you, I am the most weak, you are the most strong. In these few phrases, you didn't ask for anything per se, but you are proceeding, you are getting to that um, request that you are going to make, that talab, that you are going to make in that dua. And follow the dua with good actions. Follow the dua with good actions. The Prophet ﷺ told us about a person who doesn't abstain from haram in their food and in their clothing and in their wealth, they don't stay away from haram. فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ So how is this person going to be responded to? So prepare for your dua by purifying yourself and purifying your wealth and purifying what you are eating and consuming in all different ways and follow your dua by continuing to purify yourself. And when we say haram, by the way, oftentimes our minds jump right away to halal and haram meat. Or halal and haram food. Does it have alcohol? Does it have pork? There is more to halal and haram than just the physical ingredients. How did we obtain it? How did we obtain this wealth? It also has to be obtained and invested 
and the growth has to be in a halal manner as well so that our dua can be responded to how is this person going to be responded to if they are surrounded by that which is impermissible so precede the dua and follow the dua with good righteous actions so that the dua will be answered and will be responded to this is a brief introduction to this series inshallah ta'ala next week we will dive right into the actual dua but there's homework you guys didn't see that one coming huh you are required to memorize this dua we will speak next week about when should you say this dua exactly so in order for you to do that you got to memorize it so are you all going to commit to memorizing this dua if you have not done so already we are going to make a commitment to one another to memorize this dua yes okay this dua consists of nine phrases we're going to divide it into three parts each week you will memorize three phrases a whole week to memorize three phrases every single one of you can do it I assure you we have given you these booklets at the top of the first page you have the dua in Arabic and then you have it transliterated because some people can't read Arabic so you can read it in the transliteration and then at the bottom there is the translation a brief translation of the meaning of course doesn't do full justice we will be explaining all of these phrases in detail so let us make sure that we are pronouncing it correctly together you guys ready yes okay the first three phrases Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant khalaqtani wa ana abduk these are the first three phrases of the nine phrases of this dua your homework for next Wednesday is to memorize these first three verses you gotta do your homework and because it's not a written homework nobody can come and say my dog chewed it that's the classic excuse huh so it's not a written homework طيب, together Allahumma anta when we say Allahumma make sure the lamb is heavy not Allahumma Allahumma with tafkhim you are talking to Allah the one who makes all of the laws Allahumma anta Rabbi la ilaha illa ant khalaqtani wa ana abduk one more time yes allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant khalaqtani wa ana abduk good yes okay if anybody has any questions uh, um, please ask your questions after Salatul Isha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who listen and follow the best of what they hear. Wa akhiru da'wana and ilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salillahumma wa sallim wa barik ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslima kathira. See you all next week, inshallah. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.